Welcome, everybody, to the show. Joining me tonight is our regular co-host, frequent collaborator, and fellow traveler, Dan Dan, the Dan Dan Noodles Man. And joining us this evening is our very special guest, Gina Willis. Gina, thank you for joining us. It's very exciting to have you here. We've been trying to trying to wrangle uh, getting you on. And I, I think the disconnect was really just like getting the line of communication open. Uh, yeah. We are delighted to have you. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So you've got two published game designs uh, in the that are already released, right? The first, of course, was Skies Above the Reich with, correct me if I'm misstating any of this. Skies, Skies Above, Above Britain. Skies, Skies Above right, Britain. Right, right. That, right. That's a different game with Jerry White over at GMT. Mm -hmm. And now just more recently, a glorious chance has come out from Legion War Games, okay. which is a solo effort of yours. So so tell I us about those. That. What, what's that, Dan? I didn't know that. Oh, well, good thing I'm here then. It's a good um, thing. So uh, tell us about A Glorious Chance. It's uh, it's naval battles in the War of 1812, as I recall, right? That's because right. That, that is an, what, what drew you to that subject, other than that we don't really have any games on it? That I'm well, it, it also ties in with how I got into wargaming in the first place. Really, it goes back to the very first experience I had with anything resembling a war game. And I grew up in the 1960s. I... Um, Played, you know, I like to play board games back then when I was little because I grew up in the New York suburbs where it was cold in the wintertime. And that was something you did, you know, board games were fun. But I'd never played anything other than like Monopoly and Clue and stuff like that. Um, but then one Christmas, uh, we had, there was, we got, we had a copy in our house of, you know, Milton Bradley had a set of games that came out where they partnered with American Heritage Magazine. Yeah. And there was like Broadside hit the beach, blue and gray. Mm -hmm. There was a whole bunch of historical board games. And mm -hmm. one of them was Broadside, which was the Naval War of 1812. It was very simple. The, bot, the, the rules fit right on the inside of a box lid, you know, but it had actual different ship types and you had little sails on them and, and a very beautiful board, as I recall. And I really, I had just enjoyed that game a lot. And I just saw it as another game. But one day when I was a little bored, I happened to notice this little historical pamphlet that came inside the game. And it was a full color, glossy pamphlet that told the whole story of the War of 1812 on the Great Lakes. And that I think is probably the first moment that I realized that a game on a table could really be about something historical and that you could actually go into the history and you know, move the ships around and change history. So I think that started my whole interest in war games in general and made me uh, connected the gaming and the history part of my interest. But A Glorious Chance specifically, um, I was, I found myself in Western New York. Actually, I was born in Western New York on the shores of Lake Erie, but I hadn't been lived there in a long time, but I had been Lake visiting. Erie is about 30 miles that way. Yeah, I'm on the other end. I was born in the New York part of it. And uh, I was visiting there with my mom and I had some time to kill. So I went, I heard that they had a replica of an 1812 um, brig, full scale sailing replica. Uh, and it, the USS uh, Niagara, I think it is, at uh, the Erie Maritime Museum in Erie, Pennsylvania. So I drove there and I was just blown away by that museum and the way they presented it. And the, the actually the ship wasn't there. It was off on a sail somewhere. But just going to the museum made me start thinking about that as a gaming topic. And as, as many of us do, you know, as soon as I got interested in the topic, then I started thinking, well, are there any good games on this? And there were, but, you know, most of the Age of Sail games I've seen are about Napoleonic uh, sailing ships, you know, mm -hmm. and people fighting Trafalgar for the thousandth time or the Battle of the Saints or there's like, there's only so many of those big Napoleonic battles, so you end up fighting them over and over again. And I thought, uh, well, what about the War of 1812 on the lakes? That's really interesting. Um, there, were re there were some War of 1812 games that had naval in them, but the naval was only a small part of the whole strategy of, the, of all the Great Lakes. Like you were basically fighting the whole War of 1812 up there, and you know you might have things representing the Navy. But I didn't. I never saw anything that was an operational, specifically naval game about that subject. So, you know, usually my motivation, well, really the only motivation I've had to design games has been 
because it's a lot of work, is if there's a game I really want that doesn't exist, then I go, well, I'm going to make it. So yeah. if it's just for my own fun, that's how it started. You know, I would do mod, I would mod certain games to create scenarios for things that weren't in them or uh, things like that. So um, that's how a glorious chance came about. That's super interesting. That it, it does seem like I, I hesitate to call it a renaissance, but we have actually seen a couple of games with a focus of on the Great Lakes area. The other one I'm thinking of is, of course, 1812 War of the Great Lakes Frontier from Compass and designer Ken Reppel, which I think came out last year, but it might have been early this year. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't get mine on schedule, so... Uh, so that's that's actually pretty interesting, and and of course you're right that we've seen you know previous Age of Sail games have definitely revolved around that Napoleonic and maybe American Revolution period, right? Well, also the vast majority of Age of Sail games that I've seen are tactical. You know, everybody mm -hmm. loves the ships, everybody loves to see the cannons going off, and so most games you're lining up your ships or you're getting them. They start at the point where the two forces are already in contact, mm -hmm. you know, or are very close to contact. What I, what I realized as soon as I started studying the Lake Ontario uh, campaign in the summer of 1813 was um, the real interest of the game was how could you have these two rival fleets that were, first of all, they had to find each other and they were hunting each other all around the lake uh, and maneuvering and, and all the other stuff that was going on before they ever got into contact. There's a lot, there was a lot involved in that campaign, including shipbuilding. You know, you had there was an arms race going on between the two sides to build the bigger ships and get them out there. So I realized there had to be more to it than just lining the ships up for a battle. Uh, and I really wanted an operational game with a campaign in it. Uh, another thing is that I really like uh, games that are campaigns, you know, like where they're operational and tactical, where you can kind of have two different levels. Like, um, I haven't played it, but there's a, a field commander Napoleon. If you mm -hmm. take a game like that where you have a battle board, but you also have a campaign where you're moving the armies around, and then when they meet, you take it over to the battle board. That, that, that appeals to me because you yeah. get to experience the campaign and the tactics. Yeah. So yeah. I, I did that for a glorious chance, too, because I, I figured uh, I wanted a, a combat system where you really could see the individual ships but I also didn't want you to have to start learning about how to set the sails and how to push them around on hexes and do learn about all the maneuvering. It's really very abstract, but it just gives you the flavor of a of an age of sail battle. And, so we, you, and we've got close action for that. So yes, exactly. And I encourage, and I say that I think in the playbook, take whatever naval game you like. You could take close action. You could take wooden ships and iron men. You could take miniatures. Anything. Close uh, Serpents of the Seas, if you can find a copy. Um, and you can set you, any battle in a glorious chance. Just stop the, stop the action, set it up on your table with your miniatures and play it that way. You don't need to use the combat system that comes in the game, even though I think it works well, but um, that's optional. You don't have to do it that way. You can play it any way you like. And that way you get the best of both worlds because you get this scenario generator in a glorious chance. It's going to generate this really rich story and it's going to give you battles that you can fight uh, all through it. And, and so knowing funny. very little about the War of 1812, let me, let me, let me get Jeff, set Jeff Beeler's question here up, and then I'll, you can ask whatever you want, Dan. Just write it down if you won't remember it. <laughs> um, I don't know very much about the War of 1812, despite growing up uh, 1,500 feet from the shore of Lake Erie, right? Um uh, but I do know that there's, you know, there were engagements on Lake Ontario, and I think there were engagements on Lake Erie too. What stood out about Lake Ontario specifically of of the Great yeah. Lakes engagements over the other lakes, knowing yeah. that nothing of importance may have happened elsewhere? Sure. Well, the first going back to my story about how the game came about when I went to that museum, that was on Lake Erie, and mm -hmm. that museum is mostly about the Battle of Lake Erie. Uh, so at first, I thought I was going to make a game about the Battle of Lake Erie, or that maybe that's what I was interested in. But as, as soon as I started researching that and the overall war on the Great Lakes, um, I started to realize that the Battle of Lake Erie is really a one-off. You know, the Battle of Lake Erie was 
a very important battle, but it only happened because the British had to, to fight. They, they were running out of supplies and their Indian allies were about to desert them and they, they had to basically come out and fight. And, and the American ships on Lake Erie were built just to fight one battle and the two sides came out, they fought that battle and it was very decisive and the Americans won a great victory. But um, really Lake Erie was the secondary theater it had smaller had the smaller squadrons and the at the time the strategists in the war of 1812 really felt that lake ontario was far more important and if you look at the geography you can see why because if you think of it like a, a tree trunk with roots and branches you know the trunk and then the branches the roots of the british um, strategy in the war of 1812 go all the way back to england there's the roots their main base in North America was in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And then they had to move everything all the way from Halifax, Nova Scotia, along the St. Lawrence River. And the only way out into the Great Lakes was through Lake Ontario. That was the central place. If, so if you could choke off Lake Ontario, then Lake Erie would wither on the vine by itself because that's way out in the West. So Lake Ontario is where both sides had their main squadrons in the Navy. And the two bases were only 30 miles apart. And that's where uh, the biggest fleets were. It's where the biggest ships were. And so I thought the most interesting game would be the one where the biggest fleets and ships were. The other interesting thing about it was the fact that, as someone said, on Lake Erie, there was a battle. But on Lake Ontario, why don't we have a battle of Lake Ontario if that's where all the ships were and that's where they were trying to fight the decisive action? Well, that's what I think makes an interesting game is the what if, you know, it's what I say is it's a lot like the Battle of Jutland. Uh, you know, the saying that Admiral Jellicoe could have lost the war in an afternoon uh, because both sides had very evenly matched fleets and both sides wanted a decisive battle. But the consequences of a decisive battle would be so great that neither side could really afford to lose. So when you have stakes that high, it makes you very hesitant. You know what I mean? It's like you want to win, but you kind of have to make sure you choose your moment to try to find a little advantage. So it's almost like two boxers on the corners of the ring, you know, trying to find an opening. And that's, that's really what Ontario was like. The two sides chased each other around the lake all summer long when they were evenly matched. And they both wanted a decisive battle. And they had a number of of battles and skirmishes, but there was never a full on action. And the, it almost happened several times, but things would have come up. Like one time it was just the big storm came up and it blew everybody off. You know, everybody just had to call it off. Um, and then there were just kind of some miscues and things. So it could very easily have happened, but it just never did. Um, so this game gives you a chance to see what would have happened if it did. And, uh, put yourself in the shoes of the different uh, Commodores. That's super interesting. Dan, you have a question. Well, thanks, Arnie. We um, do let him talk from time to time. For God's sakes. Gina, um, you don't have to answer this, but do you if you have two games published, is that right, right now? One co-design and one my own, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so your first game was a co-design with uh, Skies, Across, uh, Skies Above Britain, is that right? Well, actually, chronologically, I designed a glorious chance first. Way okay. back in 2015, I started designing it. It actually went up for pre-order on Legion, like I think in around the early 2016. Um, it reached its pre-order number very within weeks. But then uh, we had some issues with finding a developer and finding one that was compatible and staying on the project and seeing it through. So the pipeline is what slowed it down. So in the meantime, while that was in the pipeline stuck, um, I started the thing with Jerry and we had uh, Skies Above Britain come out. The, the swift moving GMT pipeline got it through. So. Yeah, well, that's I was, it. I was, I was, I was so my say, first design was actually a glorious chance, even though it was published second. Yeah, because I was going to say, why didn't GMT pick it up? Well, because it was already uh, with the yeah. Legion War Games before that happened. It was. And, and I have to thank Legion War Games for, you know, taking a chance on a designer who hadn't had a game done before. Um, you know, it, it was I, I, I didn't I didn't think GMT was an option at that point. And it, well, it was only later that they 
you know, said, oh, I wish you'd brought it to us, you know, things like that. But, um, you know, I'm very happy with the way things turned out. And, um, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a far cry, the game, um, Glorious Chance and Skies Over Britain. Um, what's, what's, what's your niche? What's, what's a subject that you are interested in most in, in gamifying? Um, what era actually is, is oh, what I want to ask. Well, I seem to, yeah, I spend the vast majority of my time playing, I think, World War II stuff, mostly. Um, Unlike the rest of us. <laughs> so. uh, and the Battle of Britain was always a great fascination for me. Just the whole legendary quality of the few, the RA yeah. pilots fighting, you know, the stakes were so high. Um, and the planes are interesting. Um, I, I actually, you know, even though I started playing board war games way back when, I went through probably a decade or more where I didn't play board war games at all and I only played computer games. Uh, and one of the things that I did mostly was flight sims. Um, I played a lot of, I had quite a few air games. I played a lot of, I loved World War I air, air games. Uh, I played a lot of Battle of Britain games on my computer. I was a lousy pilot. I always got shot down, but it was, I, I, I was very immersed in that sort of stuff for a long time. So um, I, I, I always wanted a good Battle of Britain game, but I'd never seen one that was solitaire for one thing. Um, there were some very good games out there, but, but I didn't see any really good solitaire ones. And when I saw Jerry's uh, Skies Above the Reich come out, that was a solitaire game. I loved the system. And I just thought, wow, if, if this system could be a Battle of Britain game, I would buy it in a heartbeat. And that's what I've always wanted to have. So again, you know, I wanted a game that wasn't there and I set out to design one. And what's, what's the, uh, like, what's the next thing now? Like, what's the next idea you have? Is it a World War II thing? Well, you know, I'm, well, right now, I'm just enjoying playing again because one of the casualties of being a designer is at least while you're working on a game, you don't really get to play it, just play anymore. You know, you're playing your game and you're testing it and you're refining it and you all your kind of hobby time goes into that unless it's yeah. your full time job. So um, I, I've spent so much time in the last couple of years with those two games that are out now that I just wanted to get back into playing. And that's usually just naturally when I play, I'll get ideas for things right, I want to do, right. you know? So, so for example, right now, what I'm doing is I'm, I've got a play tester hat on and I'm play testing, uh, for GMT, uh, one of the play test team for, uh, Fields of Fire version three, uh, Fields of Fire is, is my absolute favorite tactical war game of all time. I spend so much time playing that, uh, that, I ha I was just about thinking today that it's it's a hard game to learn, and I know a lot of people are intimidated by it, but right. I hi highly encourage people to try it because it is so deep that there's moments, and I found this just last night, where it's it's like the game disappears. You know, there's a magic in war games where if you have learned it well enough that you're not really puzzling over it anymore, and you're just worrying about how am I going to solve this problem tactically on the, the map, what am I going to do? The game almost disappears and I'm just seeing the picture of the story unfold down there, you know, and it's, it's really very, very compelling. Uh, did, you, did you tackle that game by yourself, rule book and you, or was someone helping you out? No, I tackled it by myself, but what I, what I like to do is. The I better guess question the, is, did you use the, the new rule book? I assume so. Um, no, I learned it before that all existed. Hard way. Okay. Yeah. And I probably made a lot of mistakes, but one of the great things about it is we say that, um, everybody, even the experts make mistakes when they play that game, but somehow it seems like all the little, as long as you don't make big mistakes on the major rules, you know, the little things kind of tend to even out. So you'll make a mistake and it helps the enemy and you make a mistake and, and then something else balances that out. And you can, in the end, you can just chalk it up to fog of war and friction and chaos, you know, and that's really what right. the game is all about anyway. Right. And like, are you playing that right now? 
I am playing that right now. I'm in the Falklands in 1982, actually, right okay, now. Okay, you're, you're play testing it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Mm, the Falklands, eh? The Falklands. So there's some new things in that. I don't think I'm spilling any beans to say that, well, anyone who reads about that campaign knows that the weaponry is a little bit different. Of course, in the 80s, you have uh, man portable 66 millimeter rockets for the British, the Carl Gustav rockets that are very powerful, bunker busting kind of rockets. And those are a game changer, certainly. Uh, and then you have modern communications. So in the, that's the biggest difference to me, because before that, I had only played the World War II stuff. And I was used to sending runners, you know, to send orders out. I was used to like you had the little walkie talkies in World War II, where as soon as somebody hid, went into cover, their walkie talkie couldn't get reception anymore and you couldn't send orders to them anymore. So that's all gone now. And, and pretty much you can talk to almost anybody anywhere, uh, which is great. So a lot of different. And is there, is there um, in, in that game, um, is there a lot of hand to hand combat? Well, it's ab uh, that game is abstracted. So you, you could imagine that some of the combat might be hand to hand, but you don't really see that. Uh, okay. Okay. The you know, you the closest you would get to that is having uh, units of both sides on the same terrain card, and you might have a grenade attack, and so you know they must be within what fifty yards or thirty yards right. to do that. So you know that they're very, 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 very close. Um, but there's that's about all. You know, you you just have to imagine the rest of what's going on. And we got ASL for that if we really need it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, so I thought this was a good question. Of course, this isn't going to be like a blanket to stay, answer about how everybody does it because everybody's going to do it differently. But did you have any input into like the box art or the cover design or anything like that? For which game? For A Glorious Chance. Uh, I kind of, no, I didn't come up with it. Um, I think I think either Mark Mahaffey, the artist, or Randy... <clears throat> found that image somewhere uh, and they said, how about this as the cover art? And I just gave it thumbs up and said, that looks beautiful. So oh, I think it's great. Well, yeah. the nice thing about Age of Sail games is almost, you take almost any great, you know, painting or drawing of those ships. It's, it always looks great. You know, it, you don't have to look very far. It's, it's, it's nice. Yeah. I, I'm very happy with the way that looks and all the components look really, really good. Um, I think it's very uh, functional. You know, everything's very functional, but it also has a little bit of a, a period feel to it. So, yeah. <clears throat> Dan, you have a question? Well, um, yeah. And it, it's a different question. We were talking about, because um, you're an artist, Gina, the way, just the way you talk um, is, is how an artist thinks the way you, you get inspired by other games and it, and, and, and it, it's, you know, uh, it works. And I asked you, you uh, are you a musician? And you said, oh, yeah. well, kind of. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't answer that way. See, that shows a lack of confidence. You should never say kind of if somebody asks you if you're a musician. You, well, if you play an instrument, you're a musician. You should just say you are. So that's, that's what right. shows. I've got some work to do on that. you know. But yeah, so I, I play the mandolin. I've, uh, I play bluegrass mandolin. I've been playing it for about five or six years now. Okay. Um, I'm not in a band, but I, I go to jams and I take lessons and I practice and I play with people that, you know, locally just for fun. Um, but are you a Bella Fleck fan? Uh, well, he's a great musician. Um, but my taste runs more to the hardcore traditional stuff like Bill okay. Monroe, I would say. Okay. Okay. Um, but, uh, I, uh, I think what's interesting is any art form. If you're a painter, if you're a musician, I mean, it, there is a similar thing with war game design. Absolutely. I like when I look at the genius of Bill Monroe's music just by playing it or trying to learn it. One of the things you start to realize is he developed a musical language of his own. And a, it's almost like a dialect, you know, mm -hmm. and when you listen to it really closely and you can see how he solved various problems musically, you know, how he got from point A to point B. If you look at a war game design, you can similarly, if you admire a John Butterfield game or a Jerry White game, you can see how they solve various problems that got from point A to point B. So um, yeah, I enjoy that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and I do enjoy creative hobbies. I've always enjoyed very nerdy, uh, very nerdy little deep dive hobbies like music, 
golf, anything that requires a lot of effort over a long period of time and has a high learning curve, I seem to be drawn to. Um, still, because, still today? Still today? Yeah, still today, you know, uh, just because I like the idea that there's never an end to it. You know, uh, it just goes on and on and there's always more to learn and, and it's very deep and rich. So I don't find the learning curve intimidating. I just okay. go, well, okay, there's some here. I'll, you know, here's something new to learn today. Okay. You know? Okay. Cause game designing is like, it's like orchestration. You got a lot of different parts, yeah. Yeah. you know, that, that, that have to work together as a whole. So yes, you do. You, all these little yes. subsystems and systems have to work Absolutely. together. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, what we've lost, I think, today in the wargaming world is we've lost the developer piece. Um, that is a real issue, I think. Uh, the, you know, it's it's almost like the analogy would be in old Hollywood. You had the studio system where you had teams of writers and producers and set designers and all these different people with specialized roles all under the umbrella of a studio who would produce a movie. And it was a great thing when it worked well, you know, it was fantastic. And I think we had a similar thing in what some people call the golden age of wargaming, like with SPI, West End Games, uh, and uh, Victory Games, um, <clears throat> the uh, where you had these, I, I wish that I was back in the days of like SPI where you were all kind of in this room together or in this suite of offices where somebody comes into your cubicle and sits down and says, Hey, what about a game on this? And you can go over and ask, yeah, okay. you know, Mark Herman, what he thinks of that. And, and then Butterfield comes over and does it. I mean, that sounds amazing, doesn't it? That you would have yeah. all these people cross pollinating mm -hmm. and Jim Dunnigan and all these great minds working together and then play testing and developing each other's games. But also they had an artist in house, they had, and they, and I think the piece that we're missing today is that everybody's off on their own, you know, designing their games. And most of the successful designers seem to have to wear all the hats themselves. So you have some really superstars who, who not only design great games, but they do all the artwork themselves. They do all their own development. That's great. I, I never wanted to do that. You know, I think I came up in the world of publishing um, in newspapers. So I'm used to working in a newsroom where right. you have artists and editors and writers and everybody's all working as a team. So right. I miss that teamwork when I'm doing a game. And so I really, that's why I enjoyed my collaboration with Jerry White, because there was another voice and another mind that might see things differently. And, and he has a perspective and I do. And from that came, I think a really good game. And I, I think if I were going to do another design, I really would look to collaborate because uh, I just I didn't I enjoy that a lot more. There's somebody else to talk to. You don't yeah. have to you know be all off on your own. But yeah. what I was saying about development is there's somebody has to be in charge of like conducting the symphony. You know, making sure that the design is good and working with the designer. But once that happens, somebody also has to make sure the artist is is responding to the design correctly and, and isn't making mistakes and that the artwork is compatible with the, the game or that before it goes to press, you know, that the rule book is working and the components are working and everything's coming out at the right price point. And, you know, what I mean, there's a certain uh, yes. responsibility, overall responsibility for the production that goes beyond the design. You know, the design's already done, but there's a lot more to do after that. That yeah. post-production is what I would call it. And overseeing the play testing, you know, making sure that it's been adequately play tested and then going back to the designer and saying, well, this isn't, you know, maybe we can refine this a little more. That is really hard to find because frankly, it's a, it's a, it's the hardest job. You know, it's more, it's as much work as designing the game and, and you don't get much credit because everybody talks about the designer and not that many people talk about the developer. The developer. There is one. It, yeah. it's, it seems video game companies tend to work that way, successful video game companies, where they have uh, – I know Ubisoft. I've been into Ubisoft, but don't tell anybody because I wasn't allowed. So I went into Ubisoft. He broke and, into Ubisoft. And it's just saying. one – when I say massive room, massive. You need like a, a – what do you call those things that don't work anymore? They're uh, – Bicycles? A, 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 a what would yeah. you say, Gina? A scooter or a Segway? Segway. A Segway. They had Segways, man. So 
you know, this guy's talking to that guy and the composer's in the back over there. Uh, yeah, whatever. But yeah, Gina, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, we got a, uh, I thought a good question from, from Stacking Limit here, and I'm going to ask this a little bit differently. But but as Skies Above Britain is a collaboration, right? Did you find that there were certain parts of the game that you worked on versus other parts of the game that Jerry worked on or, you know, be those mechanics or components or one of you mm -hmm. wrote the rule book and the other one of you, you know, sketched out the playtest map or how, how did the like division of labor break down there? Um, well, I, you know, Jerry was the more experienced designer and he had done so many great things. And remember this skies above Britain is a game in the Skies Above series, which is Jerry's series. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I completely saw that and I felt that uh, Jerry's uh, skill at creating mechanics for things was so good that it was almost like a graduate school experience where I was learning from seeing what he was coming up with, you know. But he, he would come up with some of these things and then he would show them to me and I'd give feedback on them. Um, and I guess my, I'm thinking about what parts did I have more, you know, were really my thing. I guess a lot of it was research. You know, I would do a lot of deep dives into things like the British National Archive online and look at the flight reports of various squadrons to look at like how many missions did a typical pilot actually fly in the Battle of Britain? You know, because we didn't, that was a really important question. Be, and I don't remember the answer in my head anymore, but I had to look at that because it would be very easy for us to design a good game. But then if it was, if your pilot didn't get to fly enough missions, then he would never gain experience to become an ace or whatever. Or if you had pilots that flew too many times, then the odds would eventually catch up with them and they'd get killed. So you had to kind of have this whole game work so that it worked realistically that by the end of that campaign, you'd probably have a, a squadron that had a realistic amount of, of, of aces and experienced pilots and green pilots and things like that. That was challenging. Or to try to just make sure that the victory points worked out. I think part of it too was I had some little hobby horses that I brought to the project that I wanted to see in it. Uh, one of those was, I always was a big fan of RAF 1940 by John Butterfield. Classic. You know, the operational RAF game. Mm -hmm. And I was, and and I, as I said, one of my favorite things to do is to pair different war games together and play them at the same time on different scales. Like, you know, with a glorious chance where I've said you could take my game operationally and then you could play it with miniatures or something like that. Um, I always wanted when... I always felt that uh, the ideal thing with Skies Above Britain would be if you could play RAF and run the whole Battle of Britain, and then when a battle came up, you could set it up in Skies Above Britain and actually jump into the cockpit of your plane, see how the battle turned out, and then go back to your operational fighter command. That, that would really be cool. But in order to do that, you need to think about that on the front end and try to maybe design some things about the way Skies Above Britain is done so that it plugs in and is compatible with that. So one of the ways was we divided up the chapters of the campaign using the same date periods that Butterfield uses in Skies. So for example, it would have been very easy for us to just go, oh, well, we'll have a June scenario and a July scenario and an August scenario or, or scenario A, B, and C and never even think about the fact that if you wanted to pair it with that other game, you'd have a hard time translating, well, when does the action stop in one game and start in the other? Well, this way, they're the same. You know, you can actually line them up. And, and that was something I kind of was really strong about, was trying to make it so at least we didn't do something that, that made it too complicated to pair the games together. And then, of course, I wrote... Um, a set of guidelines and the advanced rules for how you could actually um, join the games together if you wanted right, to. Right, right, yeah, yeah, I don't know if anyone's actually done it yet. I've, a lot of people talk about it, but I don't know if anyone's actually done it. It, it just seems huge. A huge it doesn't have to be. I mean, the, the nice thing the about thing it now. is you don't fight every battle. You, you just play the big game, and then you wait until something interesting happens where you say, well, you know, I'm going to make 79 squadron as my squadron, and if my squadron's in a 
scramble, then I'll I'll play that in Skies Above Britain and I'll be in the scramble. But the rest of the time, you just play the okay. operational game. Yeah. Okay. So you don't have to play all the all the battles. You just play the ones that are interesting. So I'm assuming I'm assuming Gina that uh, obviously you've done a game that is uh, operational and tactical, right? This the, this new naval game. Yeah. Right. So um, are you going to be revisiting that system again and expanding on it? I don't expect to. Uh... At first, I was thinking, trying to look around for other subjects I wanted to do, maybe. But I haven't seen any that really grabbed me, um, at least not in the age of sail. Some, you know, um, so I, I don't know. I, I also really am a big fan of community projects where other people get inspired by someone else's design, and then they pick up the banner and design games in that system. I mean, that's what I did. I saw Jerry White's game. And I said, I'm going to do a Battle of Britain version. And I, you know, he didn't want to do it. And I did it. And then he said, well, that's that's interesting. I think we could probably actually do one. And then we ended up working together and making the real game. So I would love it if someone else took that, the system I did for a glorious chance and said, I really see a potential for this in something else and then adapted it um, to another game. I think that's great. I'd love to see it inspire other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do one other, uh, you might remember, Dan, um, I have another one in the pipeline, but I'm not sure if or when it's going to see the light of day. Um, I did a an expansion for Lock and Load Tactical for North Africa. Um, do you remember that? Well, it's not Dan out. Remembers it's not that published. A game. It's in the pipeline. It's in their yeah. pipeline. It hasn't nobody's, come out. Nobody's really sure what the pipeline status is at Lock and Load. Well, right yeah, now. to be I fair, know. I mean, I think their whole production chain was hit very hard during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, Something and happened. Also, the economics of printed games, if you don't do mm -hmm. a very large press run, that's challenging. Yeah. Finding artists to do those games, you know, that I think mine got held up because they didn't have an artist for it. So, but I submitted that probably in early 2021 to them. Yeah. So that's been turned yeah. in, but it hasn't been, I think there's probably maybe a little, the artwork I don't think got done. So, um, you know. No, if it was mentioned, uh, yeah. my brain doesn't work the same way anymore. I was born in the sixties, you know what I'm saying? But that one was the, about the uh, long range desert group and SAS in North Africa. Um, using the lock and load North Africa tactical system. Uh, were there graphics already done for that? Because I yeah, I did, well, I did oh, my own and sent them a prototype of it. Yeah. And I, I didn't, I, didn't we put you on a counter, Dan, or something like that? Didn't we, don't you have an ancestor that maybe I'm thinking of someone else. I'm sorry. No, no, Dan's no, got a counter a somewhere in lock and load. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, but there's a counter of me and a counter of my granddad. That's right. I think there, I think there is one. Uh, who might actually be in that. So uh, stay tuned. Okay, okay. People, he, he's, he's a Bersaglieri. People who don't know Dan uh, saw that counter and said, isn't this one of the guys that was in Gettysburg? I wonder. <laughs> um, so we, I noticed, though, that uh, that you the, the two designs that we're talking about that, that are out, right, are, are both... Am I... So, so uh, let me ask the question differently. Do you find yourself when you're playing? Do you find yourself normally playing solitaire games? And if so, are those dedicated solitaire games or just games that you happen to be playing solitaire? Mostly dedicated solitaire games. Um, but what I will do is I'll play some games two handed if they're solo friendly. So, for example, here's something that is really fun. You know, the Devil's Cauldron in the multi-man publishing um, Grand indeed, Tactical System? Indeed, I do. All right. Um, I started a campaign of... Okay, so you know that Fields of Fire 3 is going to have Arnhem in it, right? You're going to have yes. the British paratroops for the first time. So, um, as I say, I like to pair games. So what I did is I started a campaign of the saga of the first airborne scenario, which is the whole market garden campaign just in the Arnhem sector. Mm -hmm. And I said, how cool would it be to start a game of the devil's cauldron and play it up until, you know, the, they land, they get into Arnhem, into the city, and then play it up until the Germans managed to seal off Arnhem, the city, and then set it up 
uh, in like Storm Over Arnhem or one of the tactical games like that, you know, with just the order of battle from whatever you managed to accomplish in the Devil's Cauldron. I don't know if I'm explaining that too well. Oh, but I it's get another it. Pair, it's pairing the game. So I started a campaign and now I'm just about on the point where I can start to see how it's shaping up inside the city. And um, then I could set it up with Fields of Fire or lock and load or anything, you know, and just play some of the battles and just adopt a company and, and see how my company does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, oh. so there's a two handed game and then a solitaire game. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a very well, uh, considered a very well suited system to solitaire though. with the chip pull activation. Yeah. yeah I like that. Particular chip pull like implementation. That. And I've played that game and it's, it's fantastic actually. I like games with a lot of fog of war. I'm, I like, uh, the, um, uh, the gamers uh, tactical combat series with the op sheets, you know, that's great. Mm -hmm. It's very solo friendly because you, you, you know, you're committed to whatever orders mm -hmm. you did. Um, and, uh, you know, I do lots of modding too, just as a fan, like fan fiction, like for the uh, GMT uh, battles of the American revolution, you know, the white plains game they have out now. Mm -hmm. I grew up in that area. So that I, that's like my hometown battle. And I was really into it and I played it. And then I decided I wanted a little extra fog of war. So I looked around for an order system and I, I looked at what Dean Essig did for the um, line of battle series of civil war games that he did. He had, and, and so basically what I did is I adapted, I hmm. created a set of command and control rules, rules for the White Plains game in the revolution that were kind of based on what Dean had done for line of the line of battle. So you had a few extra charts and a few extra rules and kind of an order system. And, a, and, and it, I found it really enhanced the game. It was fun. I had some generals who were still operating on orders that were hours old, you know, when they'd become obsolete and uh, generals riding around trying to get in contact and things like that. Uh, that sounds fascinating, actually. And, uh, you know, I'm also a big admirer of that particular idea of Dean's and, and how it was implemented in a couple of different places. Uh, I guess we have a question. Meandering Mike, who has a YouTube channel, it was wondering if you have a YouTube channel. No, I, I made I made one just to be able to post some videos, I think, of uh, some playthroughs I did once. Um but no, I don't have a social media channel of my own, a presence of my own. That's well, that a, that's a you know I don't really want to be pumping out content. To, oh, that'll save you yeah. so much time. Not yeah, doing that, that. That, I mean, yeah, I've you. got other. Yeah, things. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, for sure. Um, Gina, the uh, going back to the fields of fire because you're a playtester for the the part three fields of fire. I remember Ben Ho. I asked him uh, why does he stick with. Um, I think he didn't go further than Vietnam. What do you mean, go further? And, and later, later. In, war? Oh. In, 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 in in time, he, he didn't he didn't want to he didn't want to go to Afghanistan. He didn't want to do the Gulf oh. War. I think because I think he was involved and it's too close type thing. Right, right, and right. This I did game, hear that. Yeah, this game has um, it has Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, yeah. But then, see, the designer of that uh, it's is not Ben Hall, right? Right, right. Um, I think I didn't remember that actually. Yeah, I. What are you talking about? When Ben said that it had like Afghanistan that, in it. Yeah, I know. They, it took me by surprise. Right now, it's like holy moly. Uh, okay. And this game is still runs on the same rules, the same mechanics, and all that as all Fields of Fire. Nothing new in terms of a major, major change in flow mm. no no it's the base it, you know the system's the system it's just that the components are being updated revamped to really be up to like state-of-the-art graphics and really clarified rule references and you know just it, it's just really really uh slick you know so it'll it'll be probably the game that a lot of people wish they'd seen Originally, you know, but oh, really, eh? it, okay. it took a while to get there, but it's there. You know, it's there. It's it's really amazing. My I hope, it, I hope it'll bring a lot more people into the into the fold. 
Well, yeah, it's the, I mean, there's that psychological block there that everybody thinks this game is ultra hard. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I, mean, I don't know that I think it's ultra hard, but but I mean, well, a lot of people bounced off of it, right? Yeah. So I don't know that it's hard, but I do know that I, I had this experience with a, an unconventional game, and it's B, BCS is the game I'm talking about, where I felt like the 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 experienced war gamers in the room had just a struggle a little bit more with these new concepts than the fellow that we brought in from the local library who had never played a war game before and had no idea and just knew and about he it instantly, yeah. and boop, he was like up to speed within an hour and a half and we're we're two months in and still looking stuff up every week well and my i think there, is don't think of it as the don't think about the game think about real life yeah. think about you know, that, that's how I approach it. If I've got a new game, I try to look at, I, d I don't think of it as a game. I think of it as I have a battalion, I have a company, I have a platoon okay, or I have right, a okay. squadron of ships. What do I want to do with my ships? And then I think, well, what is the game? You know, I, how does the game mechanics let me do that? But I start with the real stuff first. And I think the struggle is if, if all, you do have to, I think people adapt to, the tactical games faster if they have an interest in history and they've mm -hmm. read a lot about how actual tactics work. You know, if you have mm -hmm. no idea how how the actual units operated, then you've got a lot more to learn because you're mm -hmm. going to either learn it the hard way in the game when your men get slaughtered, or mm -hmm. or you'll learn it eventually just because you read about it. But if if all you know is other war games and you don't really know how the real life Units operated, then you're kind of kind of be wondering, well, what do I do hmm. now, and and how am I supposed to do this? That's super interesting because hmm. BCS specifically treats different unit types very differently, right? That they function differently. Infantry behaves hmm. differently than armor. Recon has its own special things going on. So that's and that that seems weird, right? Uh, to somebody that's just played a lot of you know, whatever, where infantry is infantry and armor is armor and armor has more effect because there's more movement and that's basically it, right? So, you know, there's a there's a, a hurdle there just from the, the experience. Um, but I, I I think I think you're right. I think that's a really good point. I'm thinking well, about one of the things I like about the BCS is I can see how it's all designed to challenge you to think the way the actual mm -hmm. commander's thought. So what you find if you're playing their, the bulge game in BCS is you really have to start thinking before you do anything on the board. You, instead of thinking, I'm going to push this piece over here and push that piece over there, mm -hmm. you have to step back and you have to say, what do I want this division to accomplish in the next eight hours? Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's really, that's interesting to me. Holy moly. Yeah. I, I, and I, if you I, don't do that, you will end up with a giant hairball. At it's the end a of mess, the right, right. And you can't just push pieces around. So I love that. When, when, the, when a game is designed to put you in the shoes of whatever the decision maker was um, and to get you to think the way they had to think. I, I, I don't know. I, I seem to have a hard time with that. It's like playing chess and knowing 10 moves in advance. It's like mm -hmm. there, there's there's stuff that's going to happen that's going to knock you off your 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 plan and it's like now what? Yeah. Right. That's uh, exciting. Plans are useless but planning is essential, right? Yeah, but right. the thing is is that you don't have to have plan A and plan B. You have to have plan A subsection 1 this is what's going to happen. But if that happens, you go here. Oh, and that will do plan B over here. And it's like, holy Jesus, I, I don't have the logic for that. I, I, I don't. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think you're overthinking it. Actually. Well, it's a matter of how far you want to take it, you know. Um, no, I just want to beat the other guy. Oh, well, see, there is, if I play solitaire, so I, <laughs> I, I have a lot of patience for it. That's See, that's what I like about it, though. When you play solitaire, at least I find I can take as long as I want. I can go read a book about it. I can put the game away and come back months later. I can, I can really in, uh, immerse myself in the story that's unfolding in front of me. So I can't do any of that if somebody's sitting across the table, you know, waiting for me to make a move. And I'm also hyper conscious when I have right. played with other people of like, oh, you know, I don't know. There's just a different psychology, and I I don't enjoy that so much. I think I would enjoy a co cooperative game. 
Like if we could all, if all three of us could be sitting, you know, in front of a table right now playing a game and I say, Hey, Dan, uh, why don't you take that, that platoon, you know, and, and all, I'm, you know, you see what you can accomplish and what do you think I should do over here? That'd be kind of fun. I think, you know, yes, it would be. be able to discuss it while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, there's very few cooperative war games. There's a few that yeah. can be played. Well, that you way. can, you can, yeah. Uh, yeah. Including and, and, a couple of Butterfields, right? And so. Gina, what about what about the and 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 this is in, in quotations the linearity of of uh, solo games. Linearity. You know, what do you mean? The, the script it, because a solo game it's scripted and and, and it, because it has so many charts and ta and and tables oh, you yeah. can. So what about how how can we how can we play a solo game without having that script effect that that linearity I'm not sure you can and that that is the trade off to me I think uh, a a true solitaire game that has a solitaire opponent not just a bot but an actual AI kind of solitaire opponent I think it almost always ends up being very procedural like you really, in order for the AI opponent to work properly, you have to do things in a certain order and you're going to have a very, usually a very long and detailed sequence of play and you have to follow that sequence of play. Right. And even personally, I, I'm not crazy about that. I would, ra I like games where like in, um, in the Grand Tactical series, you know, you can, you can, you can assault, you can shoot, you can move. You know, it's up to you what you want to do when, when it's your your activation. But in, in a solitaire game, sometimes you really have to have a certain order of things and you have to do things the way it's scripted out. Um, and to some folks, we'll find that way too confining. You know, it just feels like they're always in a straight jacket and they're just having to follow this series of events. It doesn't mean that the game itself is is repetitive, you know. And there's still a lot of decisions you still have to make, but in order to make the experience run, you know, it's yeah, like an intricate piece of yeah. machinery. It's almost like a Swiss watch, you know, all these little systems and subsystems have to work together. And in order for that to happen, you need to do things the way they've been laid out. Um, but in return, you get a massive experience in a solo game. You can get a smart opponent in a solo game and you get fog of war that you could almost never get, you know, um, otherwise because of all the opportunities for surprise and and hidden information. Do you play? Do you prefer to play with physical components or via some online thing like Vassal? I prefer to have the game out on the table. I I can get a nice lay of the land that way. But I'm I use Vassal a lot. Um, and I, I think it's a really useful tool. Uh, many times I just play things in Vassal. Uh, a Glorious Chance was designed entirely in Vassal and it was play tested entirely in Vassal. It didn't even exist in physical form until probably the seventh iteration. Uh, and then uh, and then at publication, it's, you know, there've only been maybe two physical versions of it in its entire life. So, uh, and of course with Vassal, I was able to recruit play testers from all over the globe. Mm -hmm. Um, and I could make changes like that as soon as, you know, any chart, any component, I could just turn that right around and have a different whole different set of ship counters or whatever at zero cost. So it's, it's really valuable. Um, and I just can't understand why I would want to do everything on paper and cardboard in a design situation you know and you got to really change like... it again in a week anyway huh <laughs> well, you might have to change it again in a week anyway right? exactly it changed it goes obsolete so quickly um now the other thing i like vassal for is uh i often will play games and not finish them and i like to save my logs and save files so i can pick it back up and you know i don't like to have to leave the game out so that's great um and also if i do like I was saying before, how I was playing the Devil's Cauldron campaign, but then I was going to do Fields of Fire. Um, I like to, if I'm doing two games at once and one of them's a very big monster game, I like to do the monster game on Vassal because then I can, um, I don't have to use so much table space, you know, mm -hmm. and I can also, it makes it easy to take screenshots or, um, 
you know, transfer the data and stuff like that. Some consider it the Devil's Cauldron a monster game, I'm told. Yeah, it can so, be. Yeah. Uh, who did the graphics for a Glorious Chance? It's, uh, Mark Mahaffey was Mark involved, Mahaffey. but uh, mm -hmm. was, right. did he do the, the whole thing? Box, counters, map, and everything? Okay. Yeah, everything. Okay, that's not always obvious from the, the BGG credits. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the what made you go with Legion? Um, curious. I was... As I said, I had never designed a war game before and never tried to publish one at that time, early 2015. And I was trying to think, I saw that GMT was obviously, you know, a great, you know, major league company, but I wasn't sure they would take a chance on a new designer. And also their P500 requirement scared me because I wasn't sure a topic like the war of 1812 on Lake Ontario would attract enough interest um, to reach 500 uh, pre-orders, especially from a designer nobody ever heard of, and and also a solitaire game. I don't know if, I mean, it's hard to think back now, but in 2015 or 2016, solitaire games were not nearly as popular as they are today. Um, a lot of people saw them as kind of the um, inferior stepchild of war, real war games were between you know player versus player, and solitaire games were something a little strange, and people tended not to be, they weren't as nearly as popular. And I think a lot of that was changed during the pandemic when a lot of people who maybe looked down on solitaire games found themselves with no other choice. And then they suddenly started saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, there's some, there's some value to this. Um, so at that time, I, I didn't see a lot of solo publishers there. And I happened to hear a podcast where Randy from Legion was on and they were asking him, well, what other titles are you looking to publish in the future? And he said, if somebody showed, he said, I, my pipeline's really full, he said, but if somebody presented me with a really good solitaire war game, we don't have any of those, I'd really, I probably put, would publish that. And I just thought, well, wow, you know, I've got one ready to go. And let me, why don't I try Legion then? You know, because they're known for having really high quality components. They're known for taking, um, you know, having designers who may not be as well known and also of doing niche topics. So I thought that would be a good reason to go with Legion. And uh, that was the reason. And also they only had a P250 and not a P500. So it only needed 250 pre-orders to, to get a green light. Although it eventually did, by the time it was published, I think it did exceed maybe 500 pre-orders. It took a while, but uh, you know, yeah. their pipeline is just isn't that fast, but on, to be honest about it, neither is GMTs anymore, right? So, <laughs> well, there's just a lot of titles out there all trying yes. to get attention, you know. Mm, that's, I mean, there's, uh, yeah, there's an enormous quantity of new games competing for our attention literally on a monthly basis. And I think that is uh, to an unprecedented degree, at least inside of wargaming. Let's, we're going to want to wrap up with one last question for you, I think, unless Dan has something at the end. Um, which is fine. You go ahead. You want to go first, Dan? Yeah. Go ahead. Go first. Uh, Gina, um, Euros. I love Euros, personally. Okay. <laughs> I just saw your face. Okay. So your Euros, no? Ah, oh, my God. You're a real grognard. You're a hard nose. It's bad. It, it's bad. I like my Euros with tzatziki sauce and raw <laughs> onions. Hmm. That's all I'm saying. Oh I have gosh. tried. Uh, believe me, I've tried because um, I, uh, for example, uh, and I'm not trying to diss any particular games or designers, but just to give you an example, uh, as a war gamer trying to play Euros, I expect games to be about something, you know, and and to, <laughs> and so when and so I have trouble appreciating them just as abstractions in in and of themselves and saying, oh, isn't that an elegant card system or an elegant yep, system right, of right, meeples right. that I so I, I like them to be about something. So I, I thought, well, I tried wingspan, you know, which gets a lot of attention because it's yeah, kind of yeah. it is beautiful. It really is. You have like a little the dice tower that comes with it is like a little birdhouse and you know it's beautiful. It and the cards are just, yeah I didn't know that. it comes wow. with its own little dice tower that looks like a birdhouse. And the cards are gorgeous. They look like Audubon prints you know hmm. so yes it's it's tactile beauty beauty tactile beauty it's looks great on the table it does have some 
it looks like it, it does have some connection to real birds and that like the food that your birds will eat, you know, they might eat worms and not eat uh, insects or something, you know. So there is some connection maybe with what real birds do. But other than that, um, it's just basically it could be anything, you know, you could be. Yeah, I, I get it. I you know what it. I mean? What I would do, I found myself thinking, OK, I'm a bird. What do I want to do as a bird? I want to find food. I want to make a nest. I want to defend my territory. And how do I do that? And I realized that the game isn't really about that. It's about <laughs> mastering the game system, you know. Yeah. So game, so Euro games generally to me, they're about the system and they're about the mechanics and mastering the mechanics. And the rest of it is just theme that's overlaid on top of the mechanics. And I see it as exactly the opposite. I want, if I were designing a bird game, I would design a bird war game, you know, where I'd have, uh, you know, I'd have territory and I have trees and then you'd have a resource track with your food and every, you know it'd be like that and it would turn it would basically be a war game between birds and a bigger bird encounter table bigger birds or maybe you'd form a flock where you could swarm onto the nasty bird you know, uh, you know the only Hedren. other person that that uh basically poo-pooed euro games but he didn't even want to talk about it was dean essig <laughs> i asked him so what about euro games and he's like well, I saw one once about five <laughs> feet away type thing, you know? And that was it. That was it. Okay, so... Well, what's great is we all have the things we want to play. I have nothing oh, against yeah. that at all. Uh, the, uh, well, yeah, exactly. If, if folks are enjoying Wingspan, I actually have yeah. the digital version of Wingspan, which I have never installed nor played. Um, well, I guess you're not going to do it now. Well, not at this exact moment, no. So, so last question. Uh, what is a now? This doesn't have to be something you're thinking about about dealing with necessarily. But what is a a a topic or theme or uh, era or whatever of wargaming that you think we could really use a game on that we don't have enough games on? Oh wow! Because there's there's plenty, right? It's just a matter of yeah. which one. Several have been mentioned in the chat. Yeah, I think uh, one thing I don't see a lot of, although I don't know if I'd even want to play it, but maybe, but I, I know it hasn't, I don't see much of it, is uh, tactical World War I before, you know, in the early, like the 1914-15, when the situation was still very fluid, and there was a lot of apparently very interesting kinds of back and forth infantry fighting, um, you know, before the trench warfare period started. Um, and people say that that's a really interesting period. I haven't read a whole lot about it, um, but I haven't seen that there's that many games that go into it. I think there is, um, there, if I recall correctly, I think there's a World War One, yeah, Great War Commander. There, that, mm -hmm. there's that. There's that's a two-player game uh, where somebody took kind of took Combat Commander and made it into a World War One mm -hmm. game. I've seen people um, playing that. There, but, a couple, but yeah, but good, interesting infantry games about that period. Although I have heard Ben Hull say that he, I think he was showing off some sort of a prototype. Hmm. I I saw at uh, Consum World that, at least I believe so, that there's something he's been tinkering with on that. So That's very interesting. Yeah. All right, we are out of time. Uh, Gina, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, guys. We, we may even ask you to come back at some future point. I'd be happy to. Uh, and we would be delighted to have you. So thanks, thanks Dan, for uh, for being the, the man who sets these things up. And thank you for watching. Everybody have a great night, and we will see you all again next week. Big moves. Big win. The move is loose. Big moves. Big win. The move is loose. Big moves.